So we turn back to Adam. In the garden, for however brief a moment, he was the perfect man. What he was in that moment gives us a partial portrait of what we are called to be and what we in Christ are made to be. What can we say about Adam? Adam possessed headship. But just like you want your own head to watch out for the good of the rest of your body, Adam's headship could never be self-serving. He possessed authority over his wife, his family, and all creation, not to get them to wait on him, but for their good. As a head, he possessed wisdom and knowledge and the ability to make decisions, not in his own interest, but for the good of the world. Closely related to his headship is his call to exercise dominion. He stands in the place of the Lord himself in caring for creation and working towards its good and its flourishing. Like headship, dominion is never selfish. It maintains the order that the Creator established and enables every component of creation to flourish in its proper place. Adam was also the first to hold the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. As prophet, he was the one entrusted with the Word of God. He was to proclaim it to his bride, eventually to his children, maybe even to the rest of the world. As priest, he was to bring the concerns of all creation to the Creator himself. The priest is the go-between, the intermediary. He was to know his own limitations and to commit all entrusted to his care, ultimately into the care of God. Then, as king, Adam possessed all worldly authority in creation. The buck was to stop with him. He should have seen to it that all people and all creatures lived according to the will of the Creator. Closely related to these three roles are the inherent drives of a man to fulfill what sociologist David Gilmour observed in cultures across the globe as the marks of masculinity, what men were prized for their ability to do protect, provide, and procreate. He would have done all these within his office as prophet, priest, and king. To protect, he needed to be both strong and courageous, as men today are still expected to be. Protecting means fighting with will and strength and words against anything that would threaten his family, his community, or the good of the world. To provide, Adam needed both skill and the ability to take risks, both of which men are still expected to possess. And to procreate, Adam needs Eve. He needed to pursue her, to woo her, to win her, to make her feel safe and secure with him. All of these are part of the ideal that God created Adam to be. Though on this side of the resurrection, we will never match the ideal, nor even come close. We are always striving forward toward this resurrection reality, which is already ours in baptism. Man was just a flash in the pan in its duration. The portrait of the second Adam, Christ, is eternal. Adam was made in his image. And Adam will be recreated in his image in the resurrection. But Christ's portrait of man before and since his incarnation is constant and perfect. As a perfect man, Jesus is a perfect husband. This is Paul's language in Ephesians 5. But before you start quoting verse 22 to your wife, exhorting her to be like Christ's perfect bride, Know that St. Paul spends a lot more ink and breath on telling husbands to emulate Christ. First, love your wives like he does his church. What does he do for her? Well, he dies for her. That's the easy part. Most guys would take a bullet for their wives, 
do the once-in-a-lifetime heroic act of giving their lives for their brides. But there's the arguably harder task of living for her each day, of dying to your own needs and desires day by day, minute by minute. Who's willing to do that? Then Paul goes on. Christ sanctifies his bride. He makes her holy. He cleanses her by the washing of water and the word. He presents her to himself without sin or blemish. He nourishes her. He cherishes her. Guys, that's an impossibly tall order. Christ makes his bride holy. She has no sins. Nothing for him to nitpick, no way for him to harbor a grudge or be resentful. Her sins are his, not hers. She submits to him because he is safe and good. She wants to be under his headship because he takes her sins and pays for them. That's what man, as husband, is called to do. Then, Christ as man is also the icon of what a man should be in all his other callings as well. Because Christ is good, man is good. He is so good that the life he gives as the ransom for mankind's sinfulness is worth more than all the silver or gold that has ever been on the earth. He's good in order to give. As Christ is strong, so man is strong. He is so strong and powerful that he never needs to insist on his own rights. He is so strong that he never forces his will on anyone else. This is pure and perfect strength of body, mind, and spirit. Because Christ gives, man gives. Jesus never takes. His mission is to give his life, to give forgiveness, to give eternal life, to give salvation, to give gifts abundantly until the day of his return. Because Christ loves, man loves. His love is an action, not a quickly dissipating emotion. He loves in his perfect sacrifice on the cross. He loves with no strings attached, nothing expected in return. He loves his enemies. He loves the unlovable. He loves rebels and sinners and even his own murderers. So does man. Because Christ fights, man fights. Jesus doesn't pick fights, but he certainly fights. He never fights against any person because no person is his enemy. But he goes all 12 rounds against your enemies of sin, death, and Satan. And he wins. Luther said, Jesus is sin's devourer and death's strangler who extirpates sin and knocks death's teeth out. He disembowels the devil and rescues those who believe on him from sin and death. Finally, because Christ prays, man prays. But prayer, unlike most everything else a man does, is not active. It's passive. It commends all a man's other work to the will and blessing of God. The work of masculinity begins, therefore, not with work, but with prayer, not on your feet, but on your knees. In a book about Christ, a chapter that focuses on the first person of the Trinity is a bit of a departure. But as St. Paul says, that all earthly fathers are so named because of the eternal fatherhood of God the Father. And because most men are or will be fathers, we would be remiss if we didn't take up the vocation of fathers in a book about true and perfect masculinity. Think of the way the Catechism treats the fatherhood of God 
as the basis for our confession of faith in the Apostles' Creed and our praying the Lord's Prayer. I believe that God has made me and all creatures. He has given me my body and soul. He gives me all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me, guards and protects me. All this he does out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. And in the Lord's Prayer, with these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children ask their dear father. This means that I should be certain that these petitions are pleasing to our Father in heaven and are heard by him, for he himself has commanded us to pray in this way. Like the Heavenly Father, earthly fathers don't provide for their children on the basis of what the children contribute to the family. They don't make meals contingent on work. They don't pay wages. They simply give because their children need what their fathers can provide. The same is true of love. God the Father does not wait for us to demonstrate our worthiness before he loves us. No, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. True love, fatherly love, does not only love children who are well-behaved, Fatherly love seeks no return. It risks everything on the good of children who may grow up to reject that love. Finally, God the Father catechizes. That is, he instructs, he teaches by means of his word. He's not like a school teacher teaching towards a test. He catechizes through repentance and forgiveness for faith and life. And he does not teach for a limited time until we graduate or reach some standard of perfect knowledge. He catechizes us our entire lives. So then do fathers. They catechize. They instruct in the word of God for faith and life. They teach by example, modeling repentance and reception of forgiveness. They teach children to pray they teach them the language of faith, embedding deep within them the words and cadences of the catechism, hymns, psalms, and treasuries of prayers. Luther's word is as clear as it is stern. Therefore, let everyone know that it is his duty on peril of losing the divine favor to bring up his children in the fear and knowledge of God above all things. As our lives are incomplete when we are separated from our Heavenly Father, so the lives of our children are incomplete if fathers do not undertake this holy task.